All right, guys. Uh, how many, does everybody here have their midterm back? Raise your hand if you don't have your midterm back. Uh, all right. Um, so I guess to start, does anybody have any questions about the homework uh, that was due today? Yeah. One B. Uh, this one? Yeah, the H1 3 I didn't know it better. Okay, so. Alright, let me just draw it real quick. So this is homework 1B. So when you say you didn't set it up right, do you mean that you didn't set it up right in Spice, or you mean when you solved it? No, like, when, when I set it up, I don't know if I do it by program or just set up each one properly. And it's like all my, uh, all my power distribution for the exact same number. Uh, okay, so let's see. So you want me to solve it then and see what happens? All right, so uh, the first thing here is that, well, I didn't draw it exactly how you would have seen it, right? Um, I just replaced this source with I, and I know that I'm multiplying I times 10K to get this voltage, right? Okay, so, so I know that that I is connected to a current source, so that current is going to be 0 0.5 milliamps, right? It's the same as this one. Everybody's fine with that? So that's, this uh, voltage source is going to be 10K times 0.5 milliamps, or 5 volts, right? Which makes Vj is equal to 5 volts. Did you get that far? Yeah? OK, so I know that that's 5 volts. Um, and then I also know the current flowing through this device uh, is 0.5 milliamps, right? And uh, so the drop across it is going to be 0.5 milliamps times 2K, or 1 volt, which makes VI 6 volts. Did everybody get that? Yeah? All right, so now I have everything I need to solve this problem. So let's go ahead and do power in red. So the power dissipated by the 2K resistor is equal to the voltage across it, right, which is 6 volts on one side minus 5 volts on the other side, times the current through it, okay, and the current through it is 0.5 milliamps, which means that 1 volt times 0.5 milliamps is going to give me 0.5 milliwatts. Yeah? That's what you guys got? Okay, let me get this cursor out of here. Uh, and then the power, let's call this 6K1 and 2. It's going to be the same. Uh, it's not going to be anything different, but the power across the 6K, the first 6K is the voltage across it, which is basically 5 minus 0. And then the current through it uh, is just, I'm just going to write it, 5 volts minus 0 volts over 6K. Um, so let me just grab my calculator. Yeah, I know. I just need to calculate that times 5. So it should be 5 divided by 6K. And then I multiply that by 5. So I get, what, 4.16 milliwatts? Is that what everybody got? And that's the same as uh, this one.
So then my total power would just be the sum of those. So it would be, what is that, 8.32, 8.82 milliwatts. All right, all good. Did you find what you did wrong? Yeah, I think you can use bias. I don't think I programmed the CCB edge properly. And so it didn't, uh, it basically made the whole circuit the same um, current. current voltage. Okay, so yeah, when you do these in SPICE, uh, I noted this last time. Let me just open that circuit. Uh, homework, oh. So it's this one, right? So the, the thing to note here is when you go inside the source, the value the value box needs to get the name of the source where the current's coming from, and the value two box needs to get the gain. So if you had those flipped, then that would screw everything up. Oh, so you see how it says VIS right here? That means visible, so you, if you want it to not show up or show up, you have to click that X. So oh, okay. it's still it's still programmed, but it's just not visible. Okay. And then now it's visible, right? Okay. Anybody else have any problems with that one? Yeah. Um, I just have a quick question about the uh, VB. In this one. So I had to accidentally put it the other way, and it ended up having the voltages be negative. And I'm just curious on how that works and why it works when it's that way, because when I look at that, it would be that because there's the negative terminal and the positive terminal, it would be an increase, and technically the zero would be the positive end, and then it would be a drop across that to a negative end. So the spice, yeah, spice defaults to measuring the current through a voltage source from plus to minus. So oh. it's measuring this way. It's, oh, okay. So if you flip it, it's taking this as negative 0.5 milliamps, it's making this negative 5 volts, and then everything's negative. Right, okay. So if you want it to measure current, you have to measure from plus to minus. So I specifically put it this way for that reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I flipped it and it fixed it and everything. I was just curious on why it worked that way. Yeah, so anytime you're going to use a voltage source in SPICE to measure current, it measures from plus to minus. Uh, so make sure you know that, that that's the case if you're going to do that. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, uh, I guess nobody probably had any issues with the other problems, did you? No? I've been thinking they were too simple and being like, there's no way it's a simple. Nah, I'm just. I'm trying to take it slow for you guys with uh, capacitors because I feel like the fundamentals are important. Uh, today we're going to talk about charge sharing, which is I think that's what's on your next homework, which will also probably feel un unbelievably simple, um, but you might have to mess around with spice because there's a lot more going on here than you're used to. Uh, so we're going to go over it on paper first, and then we'll do it in spice and example, and then your homework is basically going to be to redo what I did today in class, but with a different problem, so. Um, yeah, uh, so let's go and just start fresh on a new piece of paper, and we will talk about charge sharing. All right, so let's get this here. So charge sharing is really important uh, in memory. I talked about memory a little bit last time. Um, basically, the way that the circuit determines whether or not a one or a zero is stored in a memory cell is by using charge sharing. Um, after we go over it a little bit and uh, I show you what charge sharing is, um, I can probably explain it better and show you guys an example of how that works in, in DRAM. Um, but for now, uh, let's imagine we've got a circuit um, that's got two capacitors. This is just an idealistic circuit. It's not something you'd ever see in this form. So I drew this last time. I don't even know if I mentioned that it's a switch, but it's a switch, and obviously right now it's open, so there's an open circuit here. And what we usually do is we'll draw an arrow here to note that it'll close at some time t equals zero. Uh, but initially it's open, so we assume that the switch is open and nothing, nothing, no current's flowing because it's an open circuit. So I'll call this C1, I'll connect these to ground, and I'll call this C2. And I'm going to give them some capacitances. Uh, let's say uh, 
3.2 microfarads and 5.2 microfarads. All right? And so what we're going to say is let's imagine that these two capacitors are initially charged. All right? They're initially charged to some voltage. And that voltage, uh, let's say that the initial uh, voltage across C1 is, I don't know, let's say 2 volts. And then we'll say that the initial voltage across C2 is 1 volt. All right? So these are, my in these are called initial conditions. You're going to have to use those in SPICE. Uh, to get spice to precharge these nodes to certain um, voltages. Um, so let me just write that down. Initial conditions. And if I don't know if you guys have looked at the homework yet, um, that's due next time. Uh, but I have these ICs here. It says dot IC. That means initial condition, right? And it's basically saying uh, set the voltage initially of VL to be one volt and then set the voltage uh, at VR to be initially 3 volts, right? So when this circuit starts up, this switch is open. You see this is a switch in SPICE, right? So I'm going to go over how to, how to work with these today. Um, but basically these initial conditions set this voltage to 1 volt e with, without a power source. We don't need some voltage source. And then it sets this one as well, so these capacitors are, are pre-charged to some, some given voltage, all right? So the question would be first, what, how much charge is stored on each of these capacitors at the beginning, right? And so initially, uh, we know, right, CV is equal to Q. So we can use that um, formula to determine how much charge is initially stored on these capacitors. So if I wanted to determine the charge stored on C, C1 initially, I would just take the voltage across C1, which is 2 volts, and I would multiply it by the capacitance. And so in this case, I would get 6.4 microcoulombs, right? Everybody good with that? And so then the other capacitor, same thing. I would take 1 volt and 5.2 microfarads, and I would get 5.2 microcoulombs. So the initial uh, conditions of this circuit tell me that the, the total amount of charge being stored is basically 11.6 microcoulombs, right? The total of the two charges. Okay, so the question is what happens when the switch closes, right? So when the switch closes, we get the case where now the capacitors are connected in parallel, right? They're going to be connected in parallel. They sh they're going to share this entire top node, and they're going to be connected to ground. And what happens is charge is conserved. So charge is shared between the two capacitors so that they reach a neutral state where the voltage across them is the same. Okay? The, cur the charge stored by each won't be the same because the voltage is the same, but the capacitance is different. So each will store a different amount of charge. But the total amount of charge will be conserved. And when this circuit reaches steady state, is what we call it, the voltage on this entire node will be the same. It wouldn't make sense for this to be one single node, and we have some voltage over here and some other voltage over here, right? They're going to snap to one value, but the charge is going to be conserved, okay? So the, the, the question initially, I think, in your homework is, what's the initial charge stored on the capacitors? And I just did that, so let's see. So it says, the given circuit demonstrates the concept of charge sharing. The switch is initially open at time t equals zero and closes permanently at time t equals 10 milliseconds. Given the initial conditions, determine the amount of charge stored on C1 and C2 before the switch closes, right? That's exactly what I just did. So if you can do what I just did, you've got the first problem done. Now we say after the switch closes, right, and charge sharing has occurred, there are no longer two separate nodes, right? These nodes aren't separate anymore, but rather w both capacitors are now connected in parallel to a single node. Okay, uh, this because this entire top when that switch is closed is going to be one node, and I said let's just call it VF, right? So now the question is how much charge is stored on the equivalent parallel capacitance? Um, so let's go ahead and see how would we solve a problem like this. So basically, I know charge is going to be conserved. Uh, I just said that. So let me let me write that down. This uh, pr concept of conservation of charge is going to be at play here, and we're going to take advantage of that in order to solve this, this problem. So I know then, in that case, in the first circuit, 
I just solved for this 11.6 microcoulombs by saying that I had basically 2 volts times 3.2 microfarads plus 1 volt times 5.2 microfarads, right? That was my total charge, okay? Well, I know that the total charge before has to equal the total charge after here. Maybe you don't, you don't know that. Let me write that. Basically, it means that the total charge stored before the switch closes is equal to the total charge stored after the switch closes. Okay? That's that's the that's what conservation of charge means. So I know initially that I have two volts across the first capacitor and I have the capacitance. I have one volt across the second capacitor and the capacitance. So when I'm all when I'm done with charge sharing, these capacitors are in parallel, what's going to be their total capacitance? The equivalent capacitance. Right, you just add them, they're in parallel, right? So so I can find what is that final voltage, I don't know what it is, let's say VF times the total capacitance, right? 8.4 microfarads. And so now I can just solve this for VF and that, that will give me my V, my final voltage after charge sharing has occurred. Because I think that's what I asked in the homework. Uh, yeah, how much charge is stored in the equivalent parallel capacitance? It should be the same, right? Because conservation of charge occurred. But then what is the voltage across the parallel capacitance? So that's basically, um, oh, that's what I'm going to solve for now uh, using some quick algebra. So I know this side is equal to 11.6 microcoulombs, right? We already found that. And that's equal to VF times 8.4 microfarads. And so I divide both sides by 8.4 microfarads. These cancel. So what I get is whatever 11.6 over 8.4 is, 1.38 volts. Note that uh, we're using this equation here, right? So I have Q equals CV. Well, I could rearrange that to say V, right, is equal to Q over C, right? So it would make sense that if I have, you know, units of coulombs here and I have units of farads here, I know that my answer is going to be units of volts, right? So right here I had micro coulombs, I had micro farads, the micros cancel, and then coulombs over farads gives me volts. So that's where I get this uh, 1.38 volts. Um, now that that's done, um, I can figure out, I could go back and recalculate, you know, the, the amount of charge shared, or the, the amount of charge stored on the parallel capacitance by just taking that voltage that we just calculated and multiplying it by the total capacitance, right, 8.4, uh, I guess it would be times 10 to the minus 6, and I get 1.16, is that what we got? Oh, 11 point. It's 11.6 if you move the decimal, right? 11.6 micro. Um, I think that's everything I asked. Oh, and then I asked about the, the energy. Uh, determine the amount of energy stored. So that's just using that same you know, equation from last time. If you don't remember it, I'll write it down again. That's right. So in this case, my C would be my total capacitance, right? It would be the 8.4 microfarads. And my V would be the voltage across them, which is 1.38 volts, right? And so you just plug that in and you'd find the energy. But now the harder part is going to be doing this in spice because we're going to have to do some new stuff. But before I go ahead and do this in spice, does anybody have any questions about what just happened or anything about this? Yeah. Um, well, were you here last time? Yeah, on Monday. Do you remember I talked about pol like how there's polarized capacitors and non-polarized capacitors? Um, well, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, but uh, these capacitors are not polarized. So are you asking me if I flip the capacitors if it would matter or? Yeah, because like if they're holding a voltage, then would it matter if the pluses are on the same side or uh, the plus and minuses are on the same side? So. 
uh, if I'm if I'm working with capacitors like these, uh, there's basically no plus or minus side. There, there, it's either way. You could flip it the same way as a resistor, right? Either way, it doesn't matter. But um, polarized capacitors look like this, and then it would matter. You you always would want this uh, frowny face connected to ground. But with this capacitor, it could go either way. But I'm not working with those here because most capacitors that you use in electronics aren't polarized, um, especially when you get into like. Um, do you guys know the difference between through hole and surface mount components? Okay, so through hole components like physically go through the PCB that you're uh, designing like this. Let me show you some pictures. So this is a through hole resistor. Uh, it actually physically goes through the PCB and then comes out the other side and you solder it on the bottom. Like the, the leg comes out. Surface mount, uh, there's no holes. You just you you mount it right on top. And so in electronics, we've moved completely away from through-hole components, and we're pretty much all surface mount now. And every surface mount capacitor I've ever seen is, is not polarized. It, it can go either way, so it doesn't make a difference. Uh, why did they go from uh, through-hole to surface mount components are significantly smaller and, and much easier to solder. No. So, so when you do electronics uh, manufacturing, oh, here you go. This is a, a picture of a through-hole component. So you got the component, and then you got holes in the PCB, and then the legs come out the other side, just like that. Um, surface mount is right on top. So when you do electronics manufacturing, which I've done a little bit of, um, basically the old way was somebody had to sit there and solder all these components to the board. Well, now they have machines called pick-and-place machines. And what the pick-and-place machines do is they have a map of the circuit board, they have a map of where every part goes, and it goes and picks up every single part and places it on the PCB at like insane speeds. Like you can't even imagine how fast these machines operate. And then once they're all placed, you send the entire board into, it's called a reflow oven, and the oven gets hot enough that everything solders itself. So that's how mass production is done with these electronics. Um, there's no good way to place through hole components on a PCB uh, with, a ro with a robot, right? But it's really easy to place service mount components because there's no holes. You don't have to worry about getting them in the holes. You just have to worry about finding what's the center of the pads and then place it right there. So that's why they transition. And they're smaller. Yeah, what's up? So that kind of heat doesn't ruin the electronics or anything? So there's like a very fine threshold. Uh, these uh, reflow ovens uh, have what's called a temperature curve. Like they, they, they go up and they rise very slowly and then for a very short period of time they hit the peak and that's when the reflow happens. What's called solder paste turns into actual solder at that temperature and everything uh, solders to the board in a very short amount of time and then the temperature drops again, it, it, like linearly. So it's not exposed to that high heat for any significant amount of time I had the same question when I was working with this stuff. I didn't know how. But also, a lot of the electronics can handle that heat. Like, what's hot for us isn't hot for electronics. Um, so they can handle the heat. But if you were to reflow it over and over and over again, you would damage the electronics. So ideally, you'd want to send it through the process once, and then it would be fine. Uh, OK, so basically, yeah, my whole point there was that through-hole capacitors uh, are not they're not polarized. Like basically, it looks like this. So if you flip it either way, it's identical. Oh, okay. You've got one plate here, one plate here, and then you have your dielectric right in the middle. Exactly like we talked about last time, right? And then this is a polarized capacitor where you see that this side has to be the minus. Um, so those are through hole, but they're not. These are used uh, in power applications because they can store more charge than something this small. Uh, so inside of like some electronics, you'll see some big old you know blue round capacitors that look like this. Uh, but most of the time, for small electronics, you'll see this. All right, so we just did the charge sharing problem. Does anybody have any questions on this before I go and do it in Spice? I'm going to do the same problem, and we'll make sure we got the, uh, everything right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, regarding that command, on the top, it says T equals zero. What is that symbol? This symbol or this symbol? It's just a switch. Okay. So in Spice, the switch looks a little bit different. Right? So yeah, and Spice, the switch uh, looks like this. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it because it's a little complicated. And it's going to take some you know, exp explanation on how to use these switches. They're, they're, uh, they're voltage-controlled switches. Because you need to tell 
the system or LT Spice basically when you want the switch to be open and when you want the switch to be closed so they let you control it with a voltage and so that's what I've got going on over here so I'm going to discuss all that I'll go through this and then uh, if you still have a question you know feel free to ask sure. all right so now that we're done with this let's go into Spice uh, let me close this I don't want to save anything all right so we've got two capacitors right I said the first one was 3.2 microfarads and the second was 5.2 and they're both going to be grounded and then in spice if you type switch that's where you get the voltage controlled switch So basically with these switches, you've got, hey, let me just delete these wires real quick. You've got the switch part of it right here, right? And then the, the voltage controlled part of it up here, right? Is that, everybody sees that? So how these switches work is if the positive terminal's voltage is higher than the negative terminal's voltage, the switch is closed, okay? If the negative terminal's voltage is higher than the positive, then it's open, okay? So that, that I just said that verbally, but you'll see what I mean. So, um, you know what, before I even do this, let's just, uh, I'm just going to make a little switch circuit so you can see how the switch operates. Wow, that's not what I wanted. Okay, so let's put 5 volts right here, and let's put 5K right here, and I'll call this node V out, and I'll call this node V in. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set an initial condition. So I was talking about initial conditions, right? So let's say I want my initial voltage on V0, this node. I would say dot IC space the voltage at node V0. So I've got dot IC and then I've got the voltage V. I open up some parentheses and I put the name of the node there. And then I just write equals on whatever voltage I want it to be. So I'm going to just say zero, just to assure that initially this voltage is zero. Right? Let me capitalize this V. Oh, okay, that's not what I wanted. <clears throat> All right. And so now what I have to do is I have to create a source, a certain kind of source that's going to control this switch. And so it, what you want in SPICE is you want another voltage source. And what you'll notice is that these voltage sources can be used for a number of different things. If I right click on it, usually you can give it just a DC value, which is what we've done to this point, right? But there's this advanced button. You're going to have to use this button. And you get all these different options for the kinds of functions that these voltage sources can do, right? So what we want is a pulse source. And what a pulse source does is it basically is going to start at a certain voltage and then it can rise to an, a, a different voltage and then drop to another volt, that same voltage. So it's pulsing between two different values and you basically set the timing for that pulsing. So what I initially want here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ground the minus terminal. Because what I say, I said that the switch is open when this voltage is lower than this voltage and it's closed when this voltage is higher than this voltage. So I'm just going to set this at zero as a reference. And then this uh, output of this source, I'm going to make it my switching node. All right, let me move this all together. So I'll call this VSW. And I'll label this node the same thing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it a pulse. And I'm going to initially start at negative 1, because I initially want the switch to be open. Right? And then when I switch, I want it to go to 1, so that it'll go greater than 0. Right? Initially, it'll be less than 0, so the switch will be open. And then at some time, it's going to switch to 1, so the switch will close. And then I'll get that node to short to itself. And when do I want that to happen? Let's say uh, 10 milliseconds. And then I. So the, for the rise and fall time, guys, always just put 1p. It's telling you how long do you want it to take to rise to that voltage. One picosecond is like nothing in terms of what we're going to be doing. So it'll be basically square. Does that make sense? 
it'll be just a really short time so it won't take some like if you put like one millisecond it'll take like some significant time to rise you don't want that so if you just use one p all semester it'll be fine and if, if you have to change it uh, we'll discuss it at that time and then time on uh, I'm just gonna say one second so that it stays on so now I've got a whole bunch of stuff going on down here uh, but basically what's going to happen is initially this is going to be at negative 1 volts and this is at 0 so the switch is going to be open right so VI and V0 are not connected okay after 10 milliseconds it's going to shoot up to 1 the switch is going to close and I should get 5 volts on this output so what I should initially see is this voltage is 0 and then at 10 milliseconds it'll shoot up to 5 all right so I'm going to run a transient and I'll do it for 20 milliseconds just so we can see everything oh yeah Good thing it reminded me. You need a model definition for the switch. You'll see that I put it in the homework, so you can just copy mine. Uh, see this dot model? But basically all it's asking for is uh, a model for the switch. How do you get to this panel? This panel? Yeah. You just hit S. Just hit S. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Is that for all of as well? The ICP? Everything, yeah. Everything. You just hit S and it brings this up. Sorry guys, I thought I had told you that. I think you can also hit this dot OP button. Yeah, it does the same thing. All right, so now it's all set up. Let me run it. Okay, so what I'm looking at is this voltage is going to always be five, right? Nothing's happening over here. This is just connected directly to a battery. But this voltage starts at zero, right? And then at 10 milliseconds, it goes up to five because the switch closes. Okay? Does everybody have any? Anybody have any questions about anything that happened here? All right, cool. So now we know how the switches work. Let's do the charge sharing. You know what? I might save this. All right, cool. So now I'll make a new schematic. So I need my two capacitors, my switch. This is going to be 3.2 microfarads, I think I said, and 5.2. And then let's call this V left, and this one V right. All right, and then I need my dot model for the switch. Like I said, you guys just copy mine. It's just, it basically it asks you for a switch model because in real life switches aren't ideal right it's not just open and then closed uh, a lot of switches have a resistance once they're closed um, how long do they take like what's the delay how fast can they switch open and closed um, so those are all different things you can model but we're just going to treat it as an ideal switch for for this for this purpose and so I said my I my initial conditions were the voltage on C1 so it's going to be the left voltage is two volts all right and the other one is one volt make sure you set these initial conditions guys because otherwise nothing is going to work because otherwise it's going to treat these both as zero to start and then nothing's going to happen and you're going to be like what the heck and you're going to send a message in the group and i'm going to say it happened in lecture same old crap all right so now the last thing I need is my pulse. Uh, so I just get a voltage source. And I connect it here. You also don't have to connect that by wire. You could just connect it with names. I'll call this my switching voltage, and I will make it a pulse. So again, initially negative 1. It doesn't have to be negative 1, right? It just has to be less than 0. But negative 1 and 1 are just good values to pick. Uh, let's in this case let's do 25 milliseconds just so you can see something different. Set my rise and my fall times to one pico, and then I'll say that it's on for one second. And then my I don't need anything else. And then let's call this V switch. All right. So what we have is initially VL is two volts, right? And initially VR is one volt, right? And then after we do the charge sharing. We should see that those uh, both 
those voltages are going to, you know, the charge chain is going to occur and that entire node is going to be at this final voltage of 1.38 volts. Okay, so if that doesn't happen, then I did something drastically wrong. So let's run a transient for 50 milliseconds. And run. And so initially 2 volts and it drops down to 1.38. You guys see that? And then let's look at the other one. Initially 1 volt and it rises up to 1.38. So now you see, right, that's how charge sharing works. So what I initially had was 2 volts. Um, let me just let me do this. It'll be easier to look at. Uh, sorry. All right, so now we get a really clean look at what's happening here. So initially, right, my switch was open. I set these initial conditions. This VL is 2 volts, and you can see, right, it's 2 volts. And then uh, my VR was 1 volt. You can see 1 volt there. Here, you know what might be even better is if I did this. So you've got 0, 1, 2, and let's go up to 3. Okay. So 0, 1 volt, 2 volts, 3 volts. So they, this one starts at 2 volts, this one starts at 1 volt. When the switch closes, charge sharing occurs and they snap to this voltage. So they're both at 1.38 volts there. That's why you can't see them, right? So that's exactly what we calculated would happen. And the reason it happens is because of charge sharing. So does anybody have any questions about the spice or about the process of charge sharing that I solved here? Yeah. Is charge sharing and a thing that is only confined to alternating current circuits? Um, well, you basically need you need some initial volt, some initial charge, mm -hmm. um, and then after uh, the switch closes, um, you need two capacitors in parallel to get this new new voltage across it. So if you're saying alternating current in the sense that we have a pulse source, yes. uh, yeah, that's that's basically just controlling the switch. So maybe this would be a good time to talk about how this works in memory, just for everyone's knowledge. So what you get in memory, um, I'm going to draw a, like an application for this so that it's not just some random concept that I went over. So charge sharing. in memory. All right. So I don't know if everyone was here yesterday when I talked about how DRAM works. I think I might have talked about it or on Monday after after class a little bit. Um, but basically how DRAM works is you have a MOSFET. I've talked about these a couple times this semester now. It's basically just a switch, um, an electronic switch. And you have a capacitor. Uh, connected to that switch and that is connected over to this thing called the bit line and this is called the word line so this is called the bit line or the column line and this is called the word line or the row line okay just write it out Don't worry about uh, you know understanding what's going on here. Uh, like I'm not going to quiz you guys on this. This is just some application, and I want you to know that this stuff has applications that are meaningful. So, so you have this device here, and I've talked about how before, if we have enough voltage on you know this gate, it'll allow charge to pass through from the drain to the source. Okay. So in electronic circuits, we have a power supply voltage. Our supply voltage is something that we call VDD. You may have seen it before, or VCC, but I think more common is VDD. It's just a name for the voltage. It's it's nothing. It's just a variable. And so this bit line is going to be charged to VDD over two. Okay, it's going to be half of VDD. And the reason, so something you may have noticed on the previous problem, was that I had two volts over here and I had one volt over here. And my voltage in ended up at something in between, right? It ended up at 1.38. So that's always going to be the case. That's always going to be the case. It's going to end up somewhere in between those two values. So over here, 
I was talking yesterday about how if we are trying to store memory values, right, we're either trying to store a one or a zero. So basically the voltage across this capacitor being VDD, uh, that would be we're storing a one, okay? And if that voltage is zero volts, then we're storing a zero. Okay? So what's going to happen if this is at VDD over two? If this is at VDD over two, and I close this switch and charge sharing occurs, right? So another thing that's important is the bit line is just a giant capacitor. It has some capacitance. And then this is obviously a capacitor. So that's where the charge sharing occurs. It occurs between the bit line and this capacitor. And then this, this MOSFET is my switch. So, so we're basically looking at the exact same circuit here, a capacitor, a capacitor, and a switch. But we've got some real components, right? This is an ideal switch that I've got in SPICE. Uh, this is not an ideal switch. It's a real MOSFET that, that operates as a switch, OK? So initially, this capacitance is charged to a voltage of VDD over 2, right? So let's say, let's say that we have a 1 stored on the capacitor. My equivalent circuit would look something like this. I've got one volt here. Uh, oh, let's say VDD is one volt. That's my power supply. So I've got one volt. I've got my switch, and then I've got my bit line. And this is at 0.5 volts, right? It's VDD over two. Okay. So when I close this switch and charge sharing occurs, this node is going to go up, right? It's going to get pulled up from from VDD over two. That bit line is going to get pulled up a little bit. It's not going to get up pull up to 0.75 necessarily because we don't know what these capacitances are, but it will get pulled up above VDD over 2. But if I had had a 0 stored there, so let's say I had 0, same scenario, but my bit line is still 0.5, it's going to get pulled down, right, when my switch closes. It's going to get pulled down to some value less than VDD over 2. So this would be something less than VDD over 2. And this would be something greater than VDD over 2. And so now, this bit line is connected to a circuit called a sense amp. And that circuit can determine, based on whether this node was pulled up or down, whether or not there was a 1 or a 0 stored in this capacitor. And so it basically takes the bit line voltage in, and it outputs either VDD or zero. And so that's, that's how charge sharing is used in memory. It's literally used to, dis to detect what's being stored in the, the memory cells. Uh, any questions about this? All right. Um, OK, so. I guess the next thing I want to talk about is, yeah. So when you say VDD over two, would you just to create that? Would you just use a voltage divider to like two equal things to be able to get VDD over two? Yeah, actually, what they use is it's called an equilibrate circuit, uh, but it, it's basically a voltage divider. Uh, what they have is they have a rail here that's at VDD, mm -hmm. and they have a rail here that's at zero, yeah. and then they have two MOSFETs connected like this. And this voltage in the middle here is VDD over two, and so you take that and just connect it to your bit line. But what you, but it's not directly connected because then this wouldn't get pulled down. Uh, the circuit basically pulses high, and so these switches close, and you get VDD over two here for some because because these have some intrinsic resistance. So it's basically a voltage divider, like you said. So this gets charged to VDD over 2, but then these switches open back up. So it's not being driven anymore to VDD over 2. It's just sitting at VDD over 2, so that when the charge sharing occurs, it can actually wiggle. Right. OK? Yeah. Uh, all right, so everybody good with that? I mean, it's, it, again, this isn't, I'm not going to quiz you guys on this. I just wanted you to know that there's some application for this stuff. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about RC circuits next. I'm not going to talk about them in any kind of uh, depth because it's not even on your homework yet. And we're going to, I'm going to derive the equations for these next week. Uh, but I do want to talk about them. So it's basically the same thing we've been doing thus far, except we've just assumed that the capacitor was either charged or discharged. 
uh, we haven't talked about how they're actually getting charged. So let's just say we have here, I'm just going to say intro to RC circuits. So when I took this class, Baker said, uh, we're going to talk about RC circuits, and I thought he was talking about remote controls. Like, he did not give any context that the R was a resistor and that the C was a capacitor. And so I was like, oh my gosh, i got to write this stuff down. This is going to be horrifying. And it's just a capacitor with a resistor, and, or a, a circuit with a resistor and a capacitor. That's an RC circuit. So just so you all know and don't freak out. Um, okay, so basically up to this point, like I said, charged, charge or discharge. But there's something that very important that happens in capacitor circuits, specifically RC circuits. Um, and that is how do they charge when they're connected to a resistor? Because a resistor is needed, you, right? In real life, I think last time I went over some, let me just look at the notes from last time so I can preface this. Uh, what was last class? So I, I basically showed this circuit where we, we charge the capacitor with absolutely no resistance and I talked about how we would put a resistor there in real life because this is not a good, you don't want to just charge a capacitor with no limit of how much current's flowing into it because uh, it can blow up. So basically, um, let's go back to the, anytime we're charging or discharging a capacitor, we're going to charge or discharge it through some resistor. And so let me just draw the circuit. Let's say charging. So we're charging this capacitor. It starts at a low voltage, it goes to a high voltage. We're going to put a resistor, and we're going to charge this capacitor C. All right, so let's say that my source pulses from 0 to 5 volts at T equals 0. All right? So basically what, what we're interested in is what are these what does this signal look like over time and what does this signal look like over time? The, basically the voltage across the capacitor VC and then this will be my V in. Okay? So let me get my black sharpie. I don't think I've used this all semester. Let's just get a little plot going where this is going to be time and this is going to be voltage. Okay, so uh, let's plot V in in purple, I guess. I'll put a little star here in purple, and then we'll plot V out in red, or VC in red. And so I said at time T equals zero, so let's just assume that this was like negative 2, negative 1, 0, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 milliseconds. Right, and so in purple, what I basically have here, I'll draw two different plots. I basically got this signal going zero volts, and then at right t equals zero, my input pulses up to five volts, and then it stays there. All right, nobody has any questions about that, right? That's just the pulse. We talked about that. If you do, speak up. Okay, so now what's interesting is what happens uh, with the capacitor, okay? And so what, when we charge these capacitors, they charge exponentially. They don't charge linearly like you might assume. They charge exponentially, and there's an equation that governs that, that exponential charging and discharging. So let's put my zero here. And I'll put my 5 here. So what's going to happen is this capacitor is going to be at 0, right? It's initially discharged. And then when this signal pulses up, you know, this is going to be at 5 volts. And charges are going to start pouring into the capacitor. And it's going to start charging. But the way that it charges is it charges like this. Exponentially. Where it basically takes roughly five what we call time constants to charge 
to 99%. So that's an important note. And you might be like, what the heck's the time constant? Well, in RC circuits, the time constant is literally just R times C. It's whatever the resistance is times whatever the capacitance is. And we call that time constant tau. It's equal to my R times my C. All right. And so if you were ever curious, well, you probably haven't been, but one day you will be. Um, how long does it take to charge a capacitor through an RC circuit? It takes roughly five time constants to charge, or if you're trying to discharge it through a resistor, roughly five time constants to discharge. And so, for example, in this circuit, I made it to where it would take about 10 milliseconds. So that would mean that my tau was probably around two milliseconds because it took five time constants to charge, right? And so if I want to get a time constant of tau being two milliseconds, uh, I could have said maybe my capacitor was one microfarad and my resistor was two kilo ohms, right? So if that was the case, my R times my C is equal to two K times one micro and K and micro, that's 1000, this is one millionth, so it becomes basically one milli, so I get two milliseconds. And so obviously this, this uh, curve is a function of time, uh, my voltage of my capacitor with respect to time. And there's an equation for that, um, but I don't want to just throw it at you guys. It's a pretty complicated equation. So next class, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to derive that equation. And so once the capacitor is fully charged, right, once it's fully charged, uh, if we were to pulse this you know, input back down to zero, the capacitor then discharges in the exact same fashion. It discharges exactly the same way exponentially. And so this behavior is what we're going to be studying for the next couple classes. Uh, I think I mentioned that. Yeah, so I said begin RC circuits next class and then uh, continue with RC circuits. I haven't made those homeworks yet, but I'm going to make them in the next couple days. Um, and then next class, I will go ahead and uh, give you guys those equations and we'll start talking about them. I'm sure there will be questions and we'll continue to work with transients and pulse sources and all kinds of stuff like this in spice um, but right now I guess I'm gonna give you guys the quiz a little early today because I don't have anything else to cover and I don't want to get into this yet any any questions before I give the quiz yeah the, the paper what's up I can't hear you oh all right why is everyone mad at you for having a question? You don't want to delay the class? No, uh, I'll just copy it after. Oh, you're going to copy it? Yeah. Man, I scanned the notes. You just print it. <laughs>